All right, everyone. So we're going to move on to session two. So all things bone and endo. What I'm going to do is start by introducing the individuals who are speaking today. And Dr. McMillan is going to be the individual who is moderating the session. So to start with, um, I'm going to uh, introduce you to Kim Fung. So she is a pediatric endocrinologist in Ottawa. After completing a two-year fellowship at CHEO in pediatric metabolic and genetic bone diseases, which was funded by Defeat Duchenne Canada and Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy, she continues to partner with CHEO and the Ottawa Pediatric Bone Health Research Group under the guidance of Dr. Leanne Ward to help advance research on endocrine and bone health in DMD. So she's bringing a wealth of knowledge to today's panel discussion. Dr. Leanne Ward, um, who we've heard about earlier today, is the medical director of CHEO, uh, sorry, of the CHEO Bone Health Clinic, scientific director of the Ottawa Pediatric Bone Health Research Group, research chair in the pediatric bone health at the University of Ottawa, and pediatric endocrinologist in the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism at CHEO. And our last member of this panel is Dr. Stasia Hajinakis. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, she is a pediatric endocrinologist and medical director of CHEO Center for Healthy Active Living. She's an associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Ottawa and has been with the Department of Pediatrics at CHEO in the Division of Endocrinology since 2002. We also have two um, family panel members, and I know we met Lori in the last session, and thank you very much for being part of this panel as well. And we also have a virtual panelist um, that we'll introduce at the end of, uh, of the formal talks for this session. So I'm going to hand it over to uh, the team as well as to Dr. McMillan to moderate. a bit shorter so um hi everyone i'm really grateful to the organizers to give me the opportunity to participate in today's session um and it's always an honor to speak along with dr ward and dr hatchnakis i'm glad i'm going first because they set the bar pretty high um so the talk today is all things bone and endo and so we're going to, the overarching goal of the session is kind of to discuss with you and review the endocrine issues that can be um, seen in Duchenne and also bone health, as mentioned in the previous session. And um, myself, I'm going to focus on bone health, how we monitor and what we do to help protect the bones and adrenal suppression. And Dr. Ward and Dr. Hajinakis will tackle the other points. So we'll start with bone health and osteoporosis. Now, we know that patients with Duchenne have a high risk of fractures and bone fragility because of the underlying disease, which, you know, affects the interplay between the muscles and the bone, which leads to bone fragility, but also because of the steroid treatment that is needed for um, managing Duchenne and the effect that steroids have on bones. So if you look on the left, you see a picture of a healthy bone. And when we think of osteoporosis, it means that the bone density is decreased and there's higher risk of fractures. So if you look at the picture on the right, you can see that the connection between the bone structures and the spaces between them are, the connections are thinner, the spaces large, are larger, and this is what really caused bone fragility and increased risk of fractures. This is one of Dr. Ward's patients. So on the left, it's a patient who was 13 years old, well, who is, was 13 years old with Duchenne, who sustained a femur fracture. So where the arrow points is where you see kind of a, a, a break in the line, and that's where the fracture is. And when you, when you look at the appearance of the bone and you compare it to that of a healthy boy um, who's the same age, we can see that not only the appearance of the bone is more washed out, so the bone is less dense, but it's also more thin. And really this is the thinness of the bone is between, because of the muscle weakness and how it kind of the, affects the interplay with the bone. And all these things together are what kind of drives the increase of long bone fractures. Now we know that 
having a first fracture increases your risk of having fractures down the line. So on the left is this patient who was six years old when they had the fir their first tibia fracture. And at 13 years of age, the patient had multiple vertebral fractures or compression fractures. So if you look at the picture of the spine, you can see that the vertebral bodies are supposed to be nice rectangular shape. And in that one, in, in that x-ray, you can see that the height is quite decreased. And those are compression fractures. And the long bone fractures can happen even before a diagnosis. So we know that these patients overall just have more fragile bone. There's a lot of, well, there's a lot. There are some consequences to fractures. So we know that long bone fractures can um, lead to premature loss of ambulation. It can cause pain, same thing for back pain. So it's something that's really important to try to prevent. Um, there's also life-threatening life consequences that can occur with long bone fractures. So I don't know if you've heard of it, but fat embolism syndrome is rare, but it is a life-threatening complication of femur fracture or even a fall where the patient might not sustain a fracture, but can injure the bone. And what happens is that fat cells in the bone get released in the circulation, and then they can go and lodge themselves in your lungs and cause a severe respiratory distress. So all of this to say that it's really important to protect the bones. There are first conservative measures that can be done, and this include um, optimizing the vitamin D level, making sure you're taking good calcium intake because these are important parameters for your bone health in general. We also address puberty, so Dr. Port will talk about that, weight management, but mainly to try to prevent falls because falls leads to fractures. so to make sure that it's a safe environment and the patient has less risk of falling is one thing. And then around the world in some other parts, some other countries, some people might use growth hormone, but this is not something that's routinely done and it's not part of the clinical care guidelines and not something that we do here in Canada. So how is your endocrinologist or your doctor going to monitor the bone health? So first of all, usually they do a bone density every year. Or we try to every year based on resources. And the goal of that is to look at how dense your bone are. Now, it's not so much where exactly your bone density starts, but we also track the trajectory over time. So if we notice a decline in the bone density, then that might prompt your doctor to kind of react to that. The other things that we have to do is um, typically a lateral spine x-ray, and that's to monitor for vertebral fractures. The frequency might depend on whether the patient is on steroids or not, but usually we aim to at least one or every one to two years. And the reason for that is because compression fractures or vertebral fractures are not always symptomatic. So quite often they're actually not symptomatic. So the patients with Duchenne might not have back pain, but they could already have some changes that we see at the spine. Now the current recommendation is to initiate an active treatment with bone protection agents at early signs of osteoporosis. So these mean if we see some changes at the spine on the x-ray, or if the patient has sustained what we call a long bone fracture. And the first line treatment for bone protection at this time is called a bisphosphonate and is through intravenous route. So what's a bisphosphonate in, I guess, a really quick nutshell. So it's an agent that will actually affect what we call osteoclasts. So osteoclasts are cells that are present in, on every bones and their role is to chew up the bone and they act in balance with a different cells that is um, responsible for making new bones. And in patients with osteoporosis, these osteoclasts kind of are more numerous or more active. So you get a bit more bone that gets chewed up and the bisphosphate is going to come and stop these cells from acting. Um, and this will lead to increasing your bone density and protecting, especially well, your spine really well. If you go on Google and you type bisphosphonate, you'll see that there are some oral agents and there's some intravenous agents. So why or is your doctor <laughs> making you take the intravenous route? It's because it's been shown in children when we look at other conditions where they have fragile bone that the intravenous route is really the most effective treatment to protect the bone in a growing child versus the oral agent. So that's why your doctor will offer you the intravenous route. There are studies being done to look at other types of therapies to protect the bone and that might come down, um, that might be available in the future. But right now, that what we have is the intravenous bisphosphonate. You might have heard or you might know that with the first infusion, the patients can have 
quite a bit of side effects. So I'm going to have fever, some flu-like symptoms, not feel super well. So in the medical community, we're working really hard to try to mitigate those side effects. And some interventions that can be done is include to be well hydrated before and after the infusion, and then to take maybe some anti-nausea medication, um, Tylenol, ibuprofen, and then stress doses as prescribed by your doctor. And if ever the child or the patient is not feeling well, then you should always be able to contact um, a point of care. So your endocrinologist or their team, if there's any concerns. Now, speaking of stress dose, we'll move on to the next topic, which is adrenal insufficiency, um, also called adrenal suppression or steroid dependence. So, well, what is adrenal insufficiency? Simply, it's when your adrenals fall asleep. <laughs> so adrenals are little glands that sit on top of your kidney, and their role is to produce cortisol. And when you're on high-dose steroids, well, in the context of Duchenne, because you're on high-dose steroids, your adrenal will fall asleep and then not be able to produce as much cortisol. The reason for that is because in your body, there's kind of a chain of command of different glands that produce different hormones that basically signal to your adrenal to produce cortisol. And when you take high dose steroids like teflazacord, prednisone, um, vomorolone, it kind of stops that chain of commands and then your adrenal just won't wake up. What is cortisol? So cortisol is sort of the hormone that is important for your body. It's like gas in a car, so it keeps you going, but it's also the hormone that's really, really important for stress. So when your body's undergoing a medical stress, normally it will signal to your adrenal to produce more cortisol. But if your, your adrenals are sleeping, then that signal doesn't happen. Um, and like I said, it's important to for your body to be able to handle the stress. So that's include fever, vomiting illness, any accidents such as fractures or surgery. And if your adrenals are sleeping, that, that uh, increase in cortisol won't happen. Therefore, it's really important for patients who are already on steroids when they undergo a medical stress to take what we call stress dosing to really mimic the body's natural response to stress. And stress dosing are taken either orally or by injections. So if you don't take stress dosing or you have symptoms of adrenal insufficiency, the symptoms are a bit vague, but you can have fatigue, nausea, vomiting, headache, body aches and pain, low blood pressure, and it can be really life-threatening to not stress dose appropriately. So it's really important to be aware of the guidelines to do that, when to do it, and then to have it written on your medical or bracelet. So I've been talking about stress dosing. So how do we stress dose? Like I said, there's oral stress dosing and in intramuscular by injection stress dosing. So oral stress dosing is when you're basically not vomiting. So you're able to take, to take a pill and keep it down. And we recommend stress dosing when patient has a fever, so 38 Celsius or more. If you have a cold or an illness that's bad enough to keep you from school or doing your regular activity, if you sustain a fracture or if you have a surgery. Um, and in that case, but well, the surgery, we'll probably talk to an anesthesiologist, anesthesiologist and they'll be able to guide you. But in the other context, you would need extra extra steroid. And the way it usually works is that you take your usual steroids in the morning, so your deflazacord or your prednisone, and then the way to stress those throughout the day might is going to depend on the way your doctor prescribes it. So some patients take half a dose of, let's say, deflazacord in the afternoon. Other patients will use a different steroid to stress those, so called hydrocortisone. So just follow whatever your doctor has prescribed for you. One parenthesis I want to make is that if anyone here is on Vomorolone, you cannot use Vomorolone to stress dose. So if ever you encounter a certain stress that requires stress dosing, the patient takes their Vomorolone, but you also will have to have a prescription for oral hydrocortisone to stress us on top of that. Now, when would we need to use an injectable um, for stress dosing? That's when you're vomiting. So if you ever are not able to keep a pill down, let's say you take it 45 minutes, you vomit again, then chances are you won't be able to stress orally. Or if you have multiple episodes of vomiting in one day, that's when the injectable would be warranted. 
Should see the intramuscular hydrocortisone as an insurance policy. Chances are you won't need it, but if ever you do, you'll be glad to have it. So typically when the doctor prescribes that, they also ask a nurse or someone on their team to do the teaching on how to um, give the intramuscular injection. And because most patients won't actually use it, if ever you do need to use it, it might be a bit finicky and not so sure what to do. So if you're close to an emergency room, you can go directly there. But if you're camping in the boonies and like four hours away from a hospital, the intramuscular injection is essential to be able to buy you time to make it to the emergency room. We do have a video at Chio that shows how to use it. So we can probably share the link afterwards. It's nice to kind of have a refresher every now and then. Um, so just another parenthesis about embolism syndrome. So this is a condition, like I said, that was life-threatening, it's rare, but it's important to recognize the sign. So if there is respiratory distress or neurological changes after a fall, so the patient is more lethargic, kind of not responding as much, then it's important to one stress dose and then to bring them to the hospital as close as possible so they can get emergency care. So it's really important for patients, but also for all healthcare providers to know that stress dosing is essential and then patients should really have adequate education on how to do it, when to do it, and how to manage adrenal insufficiency. Patients should have a clear care plan and also a number to call in case of emergency. So either your endocrinologist, your neuromuscular doctor, um, and then when you can call, if you ever have to give the intramuscular injections, or if you have to go to the hospital for that, it's good to let them know. Or if you're giving or stress dosing and you've been giving for two, three days and things are just not getting better, it's also good to call your contact point. Um, it's good to have a card in the wallet or maybe people don't have a wallet anymore and just carry their phone or something on your phone that has your stress dosing plan so that if something happens and you go to a different ER or somewhere that you're not used to, you can give that to them and they can react quickly and know how to manage things. And then sometimes we're not sure if we should stress dose or not. We're like, well, I'm a bit tired, but is it enough? Is this is why I stress dose. We always say err on the side of caution. Um, you'll never be wrong for giving an extra dose of steroids, but not giving it in a context where you would need it can actually be life-threatening. So we, if you're thinking about it, just give it. And then I guess my last point is that because when your adrenals go to sleep, it can take time for them to wake up if ever you decide to come off steroids. So it's really, really important to never stop steroids abruptly. And by steroids, I mean the flazacor, the pratazone, or the vimorolone. If this is one of the discussion that, or something you're thinking about, it's really important to talk to your doctor so you can have a clear plan on how to decrease slowly the dose of steroid over time so that your adrenal can wake up appropriately. That's it. Thank you very much, Dr. Fung, for that very important information. What I may ask people to do is if you could just write down your questions on a piece of paper that you have in your kit, and then at the end of the session, we'll ask questions to all of our panel members. Okay, I just want to be cognizant that we're actually going to be able to get through all of the information. So I think Dr. Ward is next. Dr. Hagenakis. I apologize. Dr. Hagenakis, I'll ask you to come up and we'll switch over the slides. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. It's lovely to be here. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Um, and I, I do hope that we have lots of time for discussion uh, at the end. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about weight management in the context of Duchenne's. Um, I have a few disclosures. I, I, uh, I have received some honoraria from uh, pharmaceutical companies, including Novo Nordisk and Rhythm Pharmaceuticals. I think the other important disclosure is that while I've met a few uh, uh, people throughout my career with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, I really am here to learn from you in terms of your lived experience um, of living with Duchenne's. I have spent a lot of time talking to youth and families and children who are living with severe complex obesity, and that's my area of expertise. And so to sort of ground our discussion, I think it's important in both the context of severe complex obesity, but also I think in the context of Duchenne's that, that um, 
to remember that all bodies are unique, that that all bodies are whole, that they're complex, and that that we need to meet their needs and uh, understand them, and that and that we're powerful uh, because of our differences, and not um, uh, and to 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 be respectful of that, and remembering that health and well-being exists across a range a range of body shapes, sizes, and abilities. When it comes to body weight regulation, it is a highly complex uh, system and it is beyond uh, individual control. Uh, we know that in terms of our body shape and size, 50 to 90% uh, uh, comes from our genes. So in, in, to, in, in our world, um, some, of us, uh, some of us have bodies that will gain weight more easily. Uh, some have bodies that um, don't gain weight easily. And then in the context of a, a condition like Duchenne's, you have all other factors that are going to contribute uh, uh, contribute to this system. Um, and so it can be frustrating for people uh, in, in that they're, they're living lives, uh, they're thinking about their lifestyle and healthy eating and being active. Uh, and, and those are all very important in terms of keeping our bodies healthy. The way our bodies respond is, is really modulated through our genetic and prenatal programming and other exposures as we live our lives, uh, developmental medical issues that come up uh, for us and social, psychosocial issues as well. We know that there are exposures in utero that can increase our risk for gaining weight more easily, including exposure to diabetes in utero. Um, and also we're, we're recognizing that there are certain things, uh, even intergenerationally, like uh, experiences of trauma in our past that can, in our, in our past generations that can also impact uh, risk for obesity. So we all live in a weight promoting environment. We all engage in weight promoting behaviors, but some of us will have stability in our weight. Some will gain weight and some will gain weight with uh, complications as well. And in the context of Duchenne's, you also have weight promoting medication that's being prescribed and in general, uh, uh, decreased energy expenditure and challenges with mo mobility over time, which also decreases your energy expenditure. So you have a, a few other more complicating factors that impact body weight regulation. And then we know uh, the way our bodies were designed. Uh, once weight is gained, it becomes and, and neuroendocrinologically locked in. So there's a complex system of communication between our gastrointestinal system and our brain that defends our body weight and it defends against weight loss. And that's why decreasing body weight and in particular sustaining weight loss is very difficult. Um, in the context of, of for all of us, uh, for all uh, bodies, but in, in the context of Duchenne's, you can imagine it's, more, as you know, more complex. So when weight is lost, our body responds by increasing our appetite, <laughs> decreasing our energy expenditure, all in an effort to regain the weight that we've lost. And that's why uh, what you commonly see outside, outside of the context of Duchenne's is people may lose weight initially if they start a new diet or increase their physical activity, but over time, the body will respond to increase appetite, decrease energy expenditure uh, to try and regain the weight. And that's why uh, in 95% in of people who lose more than 5% of their body weight will regain that weight within the next five to 10 years. So there's metabolic adaptation that happens, including appetite hormones that change with weight loss that promote weight regain. And that's why when you're looking at weight management, and, and looking at different interventions. Lifestyle intervention is a key component of what we do. And when we talk about lifestyle intervention, we're talking about the way we feed our body, the way we move our body, the way we sleep at night, uh, the way we cope with stress. Those are the four, um, four main areas of lifestyle intervention. And those, you know, engaging in lifestyle intervention will improve health and well being in terms of the impact on your body weight. It's modest. So you can expect body weight stabilization potentially, or a decrease of two to 3% in terms of your body weight. Um, but, and for some, for some people that may be enough, but for those for whom their body weight is causing significant health issues um, or complications in their life, uh, we, we need to be able to offer other options. And our toolbox in terms of uh, weight management tools uh, is increasing. Um, so we, we do have more to offer than we used to uh, in, in, in this area. 
when I think about uh, weight management, I just want to think about some key principles in the way that we approach things. We, we, our goal is really to improve health and well-being. Uh, we don't spend a lot of time focusing on the numbers on the scale, but more how it is, how is your body weight or size impacting you day to day? Is it making things more difficult for you? And how can we help uh, with, with those issues and what's available to help? Uh, we also recognize that weight is beyond individual control. In the same way that my height is, in, is beyond my individual control. Um, and also, um, a lot of the young people I see uh, also experience significant bias and discrimination weight uh, related to their body shape and size. And, and that can be a barrier to coming to a doctor and feeling comfortable talking about body weight um, and, and engaging in weight management. Um, our goal is really to address uh, the root causes and try and understand what's happening for you. What, what, are, what, are the, what are the things that might be causing your body weight to increase more rapidly? And what's, what's get, what might be some of the barriers uh, that, that can get in the way of weight management and try and address those and recognize that success is different from every patient, every family. Um, and, and the goals are not gonna be the same across the board. How does body weight, how does body weight and, and size impact our health? There's really four main areas of health that can be impacted by our body weight or make weight management more difficult. So there are metabolic uh, health complications that we'll screen for. Um, those are, are really responsive to lifestyle intervention. So if you've got some lipid abnormalities or um, or blood sugars are a little elevated, we can address those issues through lifestyle intervention uh, even and, and can see improvement even if body weight doesn't change. Um, in the context of Duchenne's, you also have corticosteroids, which can negatively impact your metabolic health. Um, biomechanical complications are more challenging. So that's the impact of having a higher body weight on your skeleton, on your, move, on your movement, um, and, and, um, and, and those are difficult because they can be barriers to weight management and, um, and don't uh, uh, improve uh, e easily without significant uh, decrease in body weight. For some people, um, when I think about mental health, mental health and, and body weight regulation um, is kind of is a bi-directional pro process in general. So uh, sometimes if, uh, if, our mental health is negatively impacted. That can affect our eating, sleeping, activity habits, and, and that way impact our body weight. And then sometimes as weight is gained, our lived experience of having a higher body weight can also um, negatively impact our, our mental health. So some common coexisting mental health issues are anxiety, typically social anxiety, um, feeling different than peers, feeling socially isolated, but the other uh, features, including the other issue that tends to be overrepresented is ADHD uh, or learning difficulties. And those can also complicate weight management. So good support for those coexisting uh, conditions are important. And then finally, uh, the social milieu or uh, context of the families and, and, and communities where our patients are living. Uh, so in order for our kids to be healthy, their caregivers need to be healthy physically, mentally, financially. Uh, so you guys are key players in keeping our kids healthy and uh, we need to make sure you have the support you need uh, to do those things. And I recognize the demands on caregivers for boys living with Duchenne's uh, is higher uh, than, you know, than, than some of the other children that we're seeing in our, in our, in our practices. So again, lifestyle intervention, um, really addressing any uh, coexisting mental health concerns, um, talking about the way we feed our body throughout the day, so staying ahead of our hunger, thinking about different reasons why we eat. So we sometimes we eat because we're hungry. Uh, sometimes we eat for comfort uh, because it brings us comfort. Sometimes we eat because it tastes so good and you don't need to be hungry to have chocolate or you don't need to be hungry to have your favorite food um, and it gives you pleasure. So and, and just sort of starting to think about those things. Um, the hardest time to make a healthy choice is if you haven't stayed ahead of your hunger. So you all may know if you skip breakfast um, and then it's, you know, you're sitting through waiting for lunch. Once lunchtime comes, it's, 
it's harder to kind of think about what you're going to eat or how much. So um, that's important. And then sleep. So poor sleep, uh, sleep deprivation, interrupted sleep, that, that does play, uh, have a huge impact on our appetite hormones, our cravings, uh, our energy levels, um, our focus and concentration. So sleep uh, is a key player. And I see Dr. Katz is here. She's a sleep expert. So um, someone we can uh, go to for that. And then activity. And it doesn't have to be traditional activity. I think for our youth, uh, it has to be an activity that they feel good doing, that their bodies feel good doing, or, or uh, engagement and something that uh, gives them a sense of belonging or uh, mastery. Um, and it, it doesn't have to be traditional physical activities. Um, I know there's a lot of interest in pharmacotherapy. So I wanted to <laughs> chat a little bit about pharmacotherapeutic options. Um, it's, I think there are some medication options that can help with body weight regulation. They work to disrupt some of the neuroendocrine mechanisms that make uh, weight management is so difficult, um, uh, but access is access and approval are really some of the barriers that we're dealing with now. So in Canada, we really have four approved medications for weight management, and we'll go over some in more detail. Uh, but uh, one big group is a group of medications called GLP-1 agonists. Uh, so semaglutide, liraglutide are your main uh, GLP-1 agonists. Um, the only one that's approved for youth for people under 18 is liraglutide, um, and that's given by a subcutaneous injection daily. Um, semaglutide is approved for use for people who are over 18 for weight management, but access has been very difficult. So you may know of the brand name Ozempic. Ozempic in Canada is approved for use for type 2 diabetes, and accessing it off-label for weight management has become increasingly difficult. Uh, but the brand name Wagovi is approved for use for weight management in Canada for 18 and over, but is not available because of supply issues. So, um, And we can chat more about some of these challenges. The third option is a combination pill called uh, Contrave, which is a combination of bupropion and uh, naltrexone. So bupropion is an antidepressant. Naltrexone sort of decreases desirability. Uh, so in combination, they, it tends to decrease the desirability of food or the desire for food. Um, so acts primarily centrally and is in the form of a pill. Um, and then Orlistat is approved and has been around for a long time, but really not, not particularly effective and a lot of side effects, so not really used very often. It decreases absorption of fat from our diet. So I wanted to spend really the, the bigger, big players right now in weight management are our GLP-1 agonists. In the context of Duchenne's, I worry a little, I, I, I have used them, uh, the one mechanism of action that worries me a little, depending on the age of the patient living with Duchenne's and what else is happening for them, is that it does, they do act by, they do decrease gastric mobility. So um, it decreases the flow of food through the tummy and the intestine. And, and so if, if there's already slowing of that uh, for someone living with Duchenne's, then I worry they may have more side effects. So Typical side effects are gastrointestinal, so nausea, tummy pain, diarrhea, sometimes constipation, um, increased risk for gallstones, and rarely, rarely pancreatitis or inflammation of the pancreas. But there are a number of non-approved and, and other uh, meds under study, medications under study. You know, metformin, metformin is so, metformin has been around forever. We, we've used it in type 2 diabetes for, for a long, long time. It comes in the form of a pill. Uh, it's probably the one I feel the most comfortable with in terms of uh, comfort, in terms of knowing how people might respond to it and, and less worried about side effect profile. But kids don't like, I don't know, I haven't spoken to a lot of adults because I'm a pediatrician, but kids don't like taking it sometimes because it's a big pill. It has a funny smell for some of them. It causes some tummy upset and diarrhea, but for some, they're comfortable taking it and, and, and um, it can be helpful, as Dr. McMillan said, more from a weight stabilization perspective. You don't tend to see um, 
a, a, as significant weight loss with metformin as you do with the GLP-1 agonist. So you're kind of looking at four to eight percent decrease in in body weight. Um, oh, there was something I wanted to say. Uh, but yes, so so I think Dr. McMillan talked about co-prescribing. So the thing with body weight regulation, right, is once weight is gained, it becomes hard to change. So if you if you co-prescribe with a weight promoting medication, so you're starting your prednisone and maybe or your uh, corticosteroid and starting metformin, we may be able to get uh, better better outcomes. Uh, but I think we need to do the research to kind of know for sure. There are a few other meds uh, primarily that work centrally to decrease appetite or increase energy expenditure, but they're not approved uh, for use in, the, in weight management yet. Um, so pyramate is one I think that Dr. McMillan, some of these Dr. McMillan as a neurologist would feel more comfortable with than, than me as an endocrinologist. Um, but I think there are some coming uh, soon uh, on the market that may have less gastrointestinal impact, but more sort of dealing with appetite regulation and energy expenditure. Um, and, and some um, that are used in other contexts that are now being used uh, for body weight regulation. So some ADHD medications and some um, medications that have been used by neurologists for headache management and um, uh, and seizures, um, but they all have their own uh, unique side effect profile. Um, so I just uh, wanted to give, make sure I give enough time for Dr. Ward and, and for discussion, um, but I'm, I'm really happy to take your qu questions and hear uh, from you about what the experience has been like in trying to, to deal with both body weight regulation and Duchenne's together, which I, I know can be very complicated and and difficult, and we haven't been great in the healthcare community in offering uh, good tools to help. But I hope that's expanding over the next few years. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Hajinakis. And just a comment about you were talking about height. I've always considered you and Dr. Ward giants, <laughs> giants in the field in terms of your knowledge and all of your help. So on that note, I'll turn the table over to Dr. Ward. I love it. Thanks so much, Hugh. It's so great to be here. It's so nice to see the families that I know and so nice to see new families and to be here as well as healthcare providers and patient advocates. And I'm so grateful for Duf Duf Defeat Duchenne Canada for the work that they're doing. So thank you so much. I'm going to finish up this session by talking about growth and puberty. And it was very interesting that Eric signaled this as something that was really important. So I'm glad that we have the chance to talk about this. I have been a consultant to and participated in clinical trials with industry in efforts to bring better medications to children with muscle and bone disorders with funds for this work in my, uh, to my institution. So let's start with growth in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Very important to know that we can have short stature just because we're petite. Um, my mom used to say, Leanne, we can't get rats from mice. So there may just be a familial tendency to be a little bit on the petite side. But in Duchenne, there's other reasons as well. Now understand that growth hormone is usually normal in Duchenne muscular dystrophy and its secretion. Usually when there's petite stature, it's because of glucocorticoid therapy and it stuns the growth plate and doesn't allow the growth plate to respond to growth hormone. And then depending on the difference you have in your dystrophin gene, you may also have a tendency to be more petite. So let's unpackage this a little bit. These are growth curves with the height on the left and the weight on the right for boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy who were not on steroids. And the black lines represent individuals without Duchenne and the red lines represent individuals with Duchenne. Again, not on steroids. And so you can see that the red lines on the left for height are a little bit lower than the black lines. So there's a little bit of a few centimeter reduction in height just as part of having this condition. And then in terms of weight, you can see even in the absence of steroids that there's a tendency to gain weight that starts around eight, nine years of age. And that corresponds with diminished activity around that time in the absence of steroids. 
The other thing to understand, though, is what's going on, as I said earlier, in terms of the growth plate. So if you're not on steroids, then the signal from the hypothalamus called growth hormone releasing hormone is normal, and it tells the pituitary to secrete growth hormone. And then the growth hormone from the pituitary goes to the growth plate, which is in the bone to make it longer. If you're on steroids, usually the signals from the brain are perfectly normal. And I say usually because there are exceptions. And as endocrinologists, we do look at the signals from the brain, growth hormones signal from the pituitary, and to make sure that's okay, but it usually is. The main problem is that those hormones can't do their job because the growth plate doesn't respond. So just like steroids put the adrenals to sleep, steroids put the growth plates and the bones to sleep. And that's the main way in which steroids cause petite stature. Now, this is what a growth chart looks like for height in a boy with steroid-treated Duchenne. So you can see that the growth delay is very gradual. At first, you won't even notice it. And it's with time that you can appreciate that the boy is increasingly petite relative to peers. And then this is what the growth chart looks like over time. So the difference between the boy's height and that of peers becomes more marked with time. Now that blue line is the bone age. And so you can see in this individual who's about 17 on the far right in red, the bone age is about 10 years of age. And so not only does the steroids cause petite stature, but also delays the overall maturation of the skeleton. Now, how do we measure height after ambulation is lost? So can you believe that your arm span is about the same as your height? I always go this and I say, really? <laughs> is that how tall I am? But if you can get your arms out straight, that is approximately what your height is. So that's one strategy we use. And the other is we can measure from the tip of the elbow to the wrist. And there is a way of calculating that in terms of how it represents how tall you are. So those are some strategies we use to get a sense of height after loss of ambulation. People often ask me about growth hormone therapy. So I just taught you that growth hormone secretion is usually okay. So growth hormone doesn't really work. And there have been studies on growth hormone in steroid treated Duchenne. The benefits are minimal, so minimal that patients typically abandon it if you do try it. And there are side effects potentially like scoliosis, problems with glucose metabolism, and an increase in fluid around the brain, which can cause headaches. So growth hormone therapy is not routinely recommended in this situation. Inadequate evidence for benefits outweighing risks. Now you have heard, I'm sure, about vomorolone. So vomorolone is a novel dissociative steroid, which means that it retains its anti-inflammatory properties. So there's benefit to muscle. And the studies have taught us that up to three years, because that's as far out as the studies have gone, that vomorolone once daily is equal in terms of muscle strength to daily prednisone. We don't know what happens beyond three years, but that's the information we have so far. And there are some improvements in some side effects, but not all. So we know that vomorolone is favorable for growth compared to prednisone, and vomorolone seems to have benefit in terms of improved bone strength. So let's just take that a little bit deeper. I think it's really important to know what we know and what we don't know about vomorolone. So we know that no vomorolone normalizes growth. The boys are growing normally on vomorolone relative to peers. We know that the bone is more active. And so the bone is better able to adapt to weight bearing, for example. We know that it reduces vertebral fractures, but does not eliminate vertebral fractures completely. Those are the fractures of the spine. Vomorolone does not prevent excess weight gain. So if you have a tendency to weight gain on prednisone or deflazacort, you're going to have a tendency to gain weight on vomorolone. And it does not protect against adrenal insufficiency. You still need steroid stress dosing, as Kim said. We don't know what the effect is of vomorolone on muscle beyond three years. We don't know if it normalizes pubertal development, and we don't know if it reduces long bone fractures. And we're doing research in order to understand all of that so that we can share that knowledge with you as we go forward. 
So let's talk about puberty now, as Eric raised. I think this is a really important topic. So what is puberty? Puberty is the process of undergoing physical and cognitive maturation. And you can see the changes physically and you can appreciate the changes cognitively. And I was really glad that Eric pointed that out. And I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. Pubertal delay is virtually universal on daily steroids, and it can also occur on the intermittent steroid regimes, although less frequently. The impact to the boy in terms of their psychosocial life is variable, and I'm going to talk about that. There is functional impairment with delayed puberty. So with delayed puberty, the penis doesn't grow, and that can cause issues with peeing at urinals and also with condom catheters that you might need for long trips. And it can be a tricky conversation. And I'm going to talk about what we can do to make that conversation easier. Important to understand the timing of puberty. So if an individual with or without Duchenne has puberty before nine years of age, that's called early, too early. And we would look into that. And we don't see that in Duchenne typically. The average age of pubertal onset is 12 years of age in any context. And we consider puberty to be delayed when there's no signs of puberty. Um, and yet the individual is more than 14 years of age. So what happens in Duchenne muscular dystrophy? Usually in the absence of steroids, puberty is normal. It starts at the normal time. With steroids, puberty, as I said earlier, is typically delayed. And the higher the dose and the more frequent the steroids, i.e. daily, the more likely for puberty to be delayed. So how do we measure puberty? This is called the Prater orchidometer. And some of you in the room will recognize those when we take them out of our, our drawer. And so in an individual who's prepubertal, the testicular volumes are yellow. Once a boy starts puberty, they're four mLs and beyond to 12 mLs. And then men will have testicular volumes between 15 and 25 mLs. And there's some variability there. So testicles of 15 mLs can be perfectly normal. The only sign of true puberty is testicular enlargement. There are other glands like the adrenals, which can also give you facial hair, acne, deepening of the voice. Um, and that is not true puberty. True puberty is when the pituitary gland wakes up, sends a signal to the testicles, makes the testicles bigger, and the testicles then produce testosterone. So we as doctors know if somebody's having their own true puberty, if their testicles are getting bigger. And that's why we have to use the Prater or orchidometer to look at that. So what's happening to bring about delayed puberty? Well, prednisone and deflazacort shut down the signals from the brain and put the testicles to sleep, essentially. So they don't get bigger and they don't produce testosterone. So how do we talk about delayed puberty with families? So we start around 12 years of age and we'll just mention it. We'll say in clinic, do you know what puberty is? And we'll talk about that a little bit. And then we'll say, how are you feeling about your puberty? And we'll talk about the fact that it's delayed on steroids. And we're just kind of taking the pulse of the boy and the parents and seeing how they're feeling about things. And I can tell right away where people are at. You know, sometimes the boys will take their hats and pull them over their eyes and tell me, I'm not interested in this conversation right now. And we respect that, right? So our job is just to take the pulse and see where boys at are in their journey. Everyone's experience of puberty is different. Some boys, they want to know as much as they can. Others really are not ready at 12, 14, even 16, even 18. Sometimes they're not there to talk about starting up puberty. We do let them know that testosterone is an option to help kickstart puberty. Some boys need testosterone for many, many, many years before their own true puberty kicks in. We need to be talking to patients not only about the physical aspects of puberty, but the way that that impacts their cognitive development. And Eric alluded to that. And you can imagine that it's important for me as an endocrinologist to know the boys and the families early in their journey so that by the time I do bring up puberty, I've already got a good relationship. So very hard to talk about this kind of thing the first time you meet someone. And that's why I like to see these boys as early as possible. And Dr. McMillan refers them to me at diagnosis.
So we can start to think about inducing puberty around 12 years of age, usually by 14 at the latest in individuals who we know are going to have delayed puberty. But some individuals are just not ready for that conversation. They may be able to understand cognitively what I'm talking about, but they're not ready psychosocially. And then others are not ready cognitively nor psychosocially to have that conversation. What can we expect with testosterone therapy? Well, virilization, so deepening of the voice and sexual hair under the arms and in the pubic area, enlargement of the penis, and then acne and body odor. But Eric talked about the fact that he wanted to have puberty induced because of the way it was going to make him think. And we can't underestimate the importance of that, that testosterone is important for neurocognitive development, even beyond the physical changes. We can give testosterone once a month intramuscularly, every two weeks subcutaneously. There's also gels and sachets. If mom's putting the gel on, she needs to wear gloves so she doesn't get furry. So most people like the IM and the subcutaneous. And then we monitor the testicles. We do bone ages and we do some blood work to monitor that. And this is just to say that testosterone has been shown to be a little bit beneficial to bone. It's not as strong as zoledronate. So we can't use testosterone to protect the bones, but it helps. There's no positive or adverse effect on the heart, but there is benefit to the neurocognitive development. When we talk about puberty, we remember as physicians, this is a very personal decision and everybody's different. And as Dr. McAdams said, we respect that. So I've heard patients say to me, yes, I'd like to have puberty induced because I want to look more like my peers. And I've had others say that, you know, I'm really petite and I actually don't want puberty because then it will just be another difference when I'm already short. I'd rather my puberty aligns with my height. So I've heard both conversations. And of course, we are on the journey with patients and we respect both so personal decision, as physicians, we share knowledge as it evolves, and we do shared decision making when it comes to puberty. And so with that, I just want to say that um, sexuality, fertility, and gender identity is an unmet need and understudied area. And this is something that we're working on and research to understand better. And I just, again, really appreciate your attention and to these important topics. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of our speakers. We covered an incredible amount of um, territory over the last uh, 45 minutes. But uh, there's questions in the audience. If you want to raise your hand, we'll bring the microphone to you. Please, uh, please go ahead. Yes. Um, I'm Alfred. Thank you for a great, great, great presentations. Uh, just, I know it's hypothetical, but I've been asked sometimes some families what could be anticipated, let's say, if you uh, a boy would switch from the flazacord prednisone to vomorolone? Or is there any potential benefit or... Uh, Do you mean yeah. from an adrenal perspective or which perspective? Uh, what is to, yeah. Yeah, okay. Maybe I'll just start and then I'll pass it over to you. So that's a great question. So what we know is that if you're switching from classic steroids, you must not go on any other dose than vomorolone six milligram per kilogram. <coughs> and that's to protect against adrenal insufficiency and also to maintain muscle strength. And then from there after what you do with vomorolone is up to your decision-making with your neurologist. Hugh, would you add anything no, to I that? No, I wouldn't add anything to what you say. I completely agree with that. Yeah. And then in terms of the adrenals? Well, I think like in the presentation, we know that with Vimrolone, they do get adrenal insufficiency. So um, typically the patient should be stress dosing on the traditional steroids anyways. But if the patient is stress dosing, let's say with a half a dose of their Deflazacord or prednisone, they can't do that with the vomorolone. So once they do transition, it's really important that they have a prescription for oral hydrocortisone and know how to stress dose with that because it's not it's a bit different than you take like just a pill of hydrocortisone in the afternoon. You would have to take it in the morning with your vomorolone if you're sick, let's say, and then throughout the day, like another two times. So those are things that should be considered. That's great. Thank you both. Other questions? Yes, we have a few online. Um, so the first one is from Mark. 
He says, I have Duchenne. And when I was 14, I had a femoral fracture. Since then, I have not been able to walk. I'd like to know if this is normal after femoral fracture with Duchenne and why that happens. Yeah, so that this is one of the things that really bothers us about long bone fractures, as we call them. And the femur is the biggest bone in the body. And so a femur fracture is a really big deal and it can cause permanent premature loss of ambulation. So the answer is yes, that does happen. It happens frequently. Fractures of the lower extremities are more common in Duchenne than the upper extremities. In individuals without Duchenne in childhood, fractures of the upper extremities are more common. And this is because of the muscles. The bone doesn't develop the density that we would normally see, and it's also a smaller bone. And we're working on how to make that better. And one of the things that we're doing is we're starting to think about giving zoledronic acid before any fracture. Right now, we wait for very early signs and then get going. And when you do that, you usually end up treating before about 12 years of age. But we're now starting to think about starting zoledronic acid at the time of steroid initiation. So for all of those in you in the room, you're going to start hearing about this in clinics across Canada. Yeah, Thanks thank for that. You. And the only thing I would add to that is um, there's also a concept of disuse atrophy. So if we don't use our muscles, our muscle fibers will shrink and they will get smaller. So if someone's not able to walk um, and they're, they're completely non-weight bearing for a period of time after a uh, long bone fracture, from a muscle perspective, that's a significant consideration. And I say to people, all of the, the people I follow with DMD, it's important to be active. It's important to use your muscles. You, you want to find that sweet spot. You don't want to do too much uh, and, and the wrong types of exercise, but we do need to have exercise in order to keep those muscle fibers healthy. Great, thank you. Uh, another one from Nicole online, are bone changes specific to steroid therapy or are there bone effects from muscular dystrophy itself other than increased risk of falls? Anything to be aware of for Becker patients, not on steroids? So the steroids per se, depending on the regimen, there have been studies looking at intermittent steroids versus daily steroids and how that affects the bone. Now, I think in Canada, we use daily steroids. From my understanding, that's the main regimen just because of the benefit for the muscles. And whether you're on deflazacort or prednisone, their, the rate, let's say, of fractures can be a bit different. But overall, it's just an increased risk of fractures and the bones are fragile regardless of which treatment they're on. Now, there is an effect of the muscle on the bone because when you're weight bearing, the way your muscle kind of pulls on the bone helps it grow, like become wider. So if you're not moving as much and you don't have that con like same interplay between the muscles and the bone, then your bone, your bone remains a bit thinner, like the picture, the x-rays that we were showing. Um, for Becker per se, if they're not on steroids, well, they don't have the toxic effect of the steroids on their bone, but if their mobility, let's say, becomes significantly affected, then that can also affect the bone. No, thank you. I, I think we, we've also, and Dr. Ward and Dr. Fung know way more about this than I do, but we have had uh, people with DMD that have had fractures even before starting steroids or those that are not on steroids. So there is something about the condition completely separate from steroids, but steroids make it much worse. And uh, one more online. Uh, if a child chooses to take testosterone to kickstart puberty and then decides to stop, is that okay? Yeah, it's not like steroids, right? You can't stop steroids abruptly. So I love this question because it's asking about the different hormones and how it, how it is different. So you can stop testosterone and you won't have any adverse effects like you would with stopping steroids. If you choose to do that, your endocrinologist will continue to see if you're starting your own puberty. And sometimes we do stop the testosterone to see if the own natural puberty has kicked in. And if it hasn't, then the individual will be offered testosterone again. And so sometimes that happens. We start we stop to see if endogenous puberty has begun. And if not, we go back on the testosterone and you can do that. You can start and stop without any significant health consequences. Go ahead over there. Sorry, what sort of a process do we see for its approval in Canada? And since I, I know it's in quite early stages, right, there's still a lot of research going on in that field, right? Um, and uh, so 
my kid is still less than two years, right? So for for him, like uh, the the start of corticosteroid or vimarolone is uh, still too early. But um, is it a possibility possibility that vimarolone and corticosteroids can be kind of interchangeably used uh, to to see like let us say vimarolone since it's a three year study right now we have the data from three years. Uh, the child takes vimarolone for three years and then later on uh, on corticosteroid if vimarolone is not being that effective or it has a long longer term side effects how do we kind of look into that that and make a decision based upon that can i take one of those questions off yeah, your you hands so, so tomorrow in the first session on sunday morning i'm going to talk a lot about phases of clinical trial the regulatory process you know, how we access drugs in canada that are approved that are not approved options so i'll cover all that tomorrow if that's okay and then in terms of switching from vimorolone to steroids, and Hugh, correct me if I'm wrong, but yes, that is an option. You can go from vimorolone to corticosteroids, classic steroids, if you know, you're know you concerned about how things are evolving. And that, again, would be a decision you would make along with your neuromuscular physician. Dr. McMillan, do you want to add to that? Yeah, the only thing in terms of uh, steroid options, you know, we're used to switching. We're used to um, adjusting doses You know, in, in, um, in discussion with the family. So there are certainly cases where people will switch from prednisone to deflazacord or, or have switched from either prednisone or deflazacord to vomolarone to be part of a clinical trial. So we, we talk about the, um, the benefits and the risks in general, and then more specific benefits and risks associated with prednisone itself and deflazacord itself and vomolarone to, to be able to help make what decision is best for, um, for that person and for their family. There, there's an excellent st a study that's open access that I'd point you to. It's the Ford DMD study. And there, there were um, patients in Ottawa that were part of this. It was a very, very good um, study to compare objectively um, side effects of prednisone versus deflazacord. So you can look at it on a table and see what some of the differences were um, you know, among the, the people that participated, as well as daily and, and intermittent steroids, which Lori mentioned before. Um, just conscious of time. So we'll do one more question over here and then Tom and then. Hello, my name is Geraldine and I'm here with my husband, Troy, and our son, Preston, who's 17 with the Shens. A um, couple questions in regards to uh, the steroid um, dosing, stress dosing. Um, I have to say this is the first time that I've even heard of that. And when does that become a hindrance to our child if we're not doing it, because obviously we haven't been. Um, but the other thing is too, is, is the metformin and that added to the list of approved medications for boys with Duchenne's? I'll take the, the steroid question. So the steroid stress dosing is, at least at CHEO, it's something we've been doing and a lot of other centers have. And the reason that I guess it can be for some endocrinologists a harder to grasp concept is because when you're on such a high dose steroids, typically when we make our calculation and we convert it, it would be a dose that kind of exceeds what your body would produce in terms of cortisol equivalent when you're stressed. The difference though, is that the steroids that are prescribed, like the deflazic or the prednisone, the, the vomorolone, the duration of action of them to cover for medical stress is not long enough. So they don't last the full 24 hours in your body. Now you haven't been stressed and thankfully he's fine. Um, you know, but it's, it's a, I would say precautionary measure because if you, let's say you're a bit fatigued and then you don't stress, so it might take you longer to feel better. So that's one thing. But if you're under a significant medical stress and your body is just not able to ramp up that production of cortisol and it can't handle that stress, that's when it becomes quite dangerous because you need to ramp up your blood pressure, let's say to, if you, if you're sick or whatnot, and if your body's not able to do that, then you can kind of, like I said, become quite sick. So I would say if you do not have, um, a stress dosing plan, I would highly recommend talking to your doctor about it, but if he's unwell and he's not able to take whatever steroid he's on, if he's on any, um, the other course of action is to go just to your nearest hospital so that and to so that they and to tell them whoever sees him that he's on a high dose steroid, um, steroid treatment and he is adrenal insufficient so that they know the next step to do like the doctors in the ER typically know um so they, they can recognize that so that we can act quickly before anything happens I'm going to be even a little more blunt than Dr. Funk because I think she's being very kind I would say that you must have a steroid stress dosing protocol in place must 
I think it personally, I think it's unacceptable to be on daily steroids and not discuss stress dosing. It, it must be there. There's, um, there is information with other parent support groups. If you um, need your treating physician to get in touch with us to help guide, we're happy to help. But, um, but I do think that that must be put in place because otherwise um, you're, we're just kind of riding the odds. And, and I don't think that's wise. And then your question about metformin, it is off label for DMD. And, but we, we in pediatrics are very used to prescribing medications off label. Most of the medications we have available are approved in adults, but not in children. You know, there's, there's many exceptions, of course. Um, but it's just about uh, when we prescribe a medication off label, making sure that there's very good rationale for it, making sure that the, the family do understand that it is off label and then proceeding accordingly. It's used frequently, but it's off label. Hi, it's Tom. Um, my son, Aiden, as I was saying, he, he stopped walking a couple of years ago. He's going to be 26 on November 17th. Um, he's gone through, you know, the, the Flazacort most of his life, zonodronic acid. He's been having a lot of micro fractures in his spine. That's what caused him to stop walking. And um, they're, they're, they put him on something called Us Nouveau. Are you familiar with that product? That, so that would be part one. It's by injection. He's doing it daily and she's trying it on him. Uh, for 18 months. It's apparently, it's, it was really difficult to get it in Quebec because apparently all the testing was done only on women for osteoporosis. So they wouldn't approve it for him. So we got a special access for that. So that's question number one. Question number two, there seems to be a lot of debate. Uh, some of the doctors are proposing that he get a, uh, an electric wheelchair with a verticuli, oh, I can't even say it in English, man, a verticulizateur. Okay, so something to stand him up, basically, to put him in a sort of a weight bearing kind of a position, and some are for it, and some are against it. And the big problem in Quebec is they subsidize the wheelchair. So if there are, we can't get a, some real valid arguments, um, they won't subsidize it. So those are two. Do you see any benefit to that verticulizer? I'll let Dr. Ward take this question. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not familiar with the term os nouveau, but I... Right, and is it given uh, monthly by injection, subcutaneous yeah. injection? Yeah. Yes. I just, I just Googled it. It's I, I'd never a vanity, heard of it, I'll right? With you, but uh, teraparatide. Oh, teraparatide. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so all these drugs have different names. So I can appreciate why teraparatide is being tried. So this is parathyroid hormone that has been converted into a drug, and it is anabolic to bone. So zoledronic acid prevents bone from being broken down, as Dr. Fung said. Teraparatide builds bone up. And there's even stronger medications than teraparatide, like Avenity, which I thought maybe was what was being referred to here. There is good rationale for teraparatide in Duchenne. There used to be a black box warning against its use in children. So for years, we just couldn't use it because it was given at very high doses to rats and they developed a bone cancer called osteosarcoma in the growing rats. So we have not had the liberty of using teraparatide in the past in children. And the black box warning was just lifted by the FDA a few years ago, two, three years ago. So people are starting to use it uh, in teenagers and also in young men with Duchenne. I think it's, there's good rationale to do it. it. It is not a particularly strong medication. There's one that's coming out that's even stronger called Romozozumab. I don't know where people come up with these names, but these anabolic agents, there is rationale for using them to try to build bone and make them stronger by that mechanism. And I would say for your son, if this looks like it's helpful, that that's great. We, what we know about it is it's safe. And I think that that's a very interesting um, idea for which there's rationale. So 18 months, and then she wants to stop. Yeah, because it only works for about 18 months. Yeah, and so usually you do teraparatide and then you chase it with zoledronic acid to seal in the effect of the teraparatide. Is that what she said? Yeah. So I think with that, we'll, we'll end this session and we'll move on to the next one. Uh, but thank you all for your presentations and thank all of the audience for their participation.